good morning, everybody. Um, I'm legitimately texting someone as we speak. Uh, I meant to send my brother a text this morning. He's preaching today, so I wanted to send him a prayer text. Uh, so I apologize for that. I just realized that my phone was stuck up here, so I couldn't do it anywhere else. Um, it's good to see you all. If you have a Bible, we're going to be in the book of James. That's what we're studying today. Uh, uh, and so I uh, encourage you to join with us, James chapter 1. And as you're finding that, uh, I just wanted to quote a scripture to you, one that may be familiar to you. It may not, but it comes from Psalm 119. And it's one that says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. My, my heart's desire today is that uh, ultimately you fall more in love with the incarnate word, Jesus Christ, but that you would also just have a fondness and an affection to want to steal away with the word of God, that it would be a, a source for you within your life that would grant you life. And so um, I wanted just to, to mention Charles Spurgeon, uh, long dead, but a great preacher back in the day. He has this quote, he says, many books in my library are now behind and beneath me. They were good in their way once, and so were the clothes I wore when I was 10 years old, but I have outgrown them. Nobody ever outgrows scripture. The book widens, and deepens with our years. And so let's read James chapter one, beginning in verse 18. Um, and uh, this picks up where we left off last week. We, we actually finished with verse 18 last week, but it ties into our time today. James writes, it says, in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. Now, this morning, we're going to do something that I've been looking forward to this. I honestly don't remember Mission Point if I've done this with you before or not. So if I have, forgive me and humor me. Uh, I do know that uh, about four years ago, I had an opportunity to journey through the book of James with, uh, with Devin and the rest of the young adults, and he was helping lead in that Bible study. And I know I, I used this as an illustration that night. So there's going to be a handful of you that you know what's coming, and there's going to be some of you uh, you're not going to know. So if uh, if, if you've played this game before, you get to play it again. And if you uh, have never played this game before, you get to play it now. How many of you uh, know what Simon Says is? Just raise your hand. Simon Says, excellent, excellent, excellent. So most of you know what Simon Says is. So Simon Says is a game where what Simon Says, you do. You hear what Simon Says, and you do it. And so for our time this morning, and it's going to be very short, it's going to be like the shortest Simon Says Simon Ooh, Simon says game ever because uh, we're, we're, we're preaching a sermon here. Uh, we're going we're gonna to play just really two rounds of this. And so, again, whatever Simon says, uh, you do. And, uh, yeah, so hopefully you're, you're, you're able to do so. So with that being said, why don't you guys all stand up, and we're going to go ahead and begin the game, and then we'll begin to play. If you stood up, you're out. Simon didn't say. I got you awake, Henry. I got you awake. That's what you asked for. All right, Simon says stand up. Very, very good. Very, very good. If you didn't stand up, you're out. Uh, <laughs> I see you, Tim. I see you, Mike. Uh, all right, so Simon says, again, we're doing a short, short round. So Simon says, put your hands up. Simon says, put your hands up. Oh, if you put your hands down, you're out. All right, that's it. That's all we have time for. Simon says, sit down. I would love to keep playing. Uh, I remember when we played, we played all the way to the end. I think Christina, didn't you win uh, at the Young Adults? Yeah, Christina won at Young Adults. She did a good job. I, I couldn't do anything to get that woman out. I was just like, stop doing what Simon says and lose the game so we can go into the lesson. Um, 
So obviously the point of Simon Says is you hear what Simon Says and you do it. There was a, a phenom at the Simon Says game at this camp that I uh, would take some of our students to uh, at Falls Creek in Oklahoma. And uh, I mean, he was impressive and quick and fast and uh, he would get people out and it would be about 7,000 students and he would whittle it down to where it really literally was just one. It was, it was pretty incredible. But within that game, and the reason why I bring that up for today is because it would be really easy for us to look at the word, study the word. We have Bible studies and we have seminaries and we have Bible colleges and we come to church and we hear this and we do that and we have our daily devotion. And we, all, we do all these different things. But if we don't obey it, then what is it accomplishing for us within our life? And so, again, my desire is that we wouldn't just simply be familiar with the word, that it wouldn't just simply be some form of literature for us, but that the word of God is your life, that you want to feast and drink from the fountain of the word of God in order for it to, as I says here, I believe, save your souls and you are blessed in the obedience of hearing and doing what the word of God has to say. So with that, I want to pray for us and we're going to jump in. Father, thank you so much for, uh, for the privilege and for the ability that we have to come together and to, to sit under your word for just a moment. Um, I realize that there's a lot of things, at least in my mind and on my heart, that could easily kind of pull me aside and, and not really hear you. Today. And so I'm asking, Lord, that, um, that you, would be, uh, you would be our teacher. I pray that the Holy Spirit would move in, the, in our midst and help us to understand and that he would illuminate the scripture for us here this morning. And so where you're seated, would you just ask the Lord, Lord, would you, uh, would you have the Holy Spirit uh, help me to have ears to hear and a mind to understand his word today? And if you'd be so kind, would you pray for me that the Lord would use me this morning for his purpose and for his will. Well, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So the very end of this passage, again, it's good for you to have a copy of scripture. I'm going to be honest with you. Today's a day that it probably would be good to have a pen handy. Uh, I'm going to be referencing quite a few other scriptures today. Um, but at the end of this passage, it says that you will be blessed. The man will be blessed in what he does. And so I do want to emphasize to you that I do believe that when you read and study the word of God and you are obedient to it, that you adhere to it, that you will be blessed in, in the doing and the obedience of the word. Um, but I like the fact that James has this at the end of this section, because what you could easily do and what could be easily happen is, okay, so if I take the principles and the truths from the word of God or from a book and I live those out, I apply them, then that will be great. So, okay, you use the Bible, that's, that's your holy book, and you use the Quran, and that's your holy book, and you use the Book of Mormon, and that's your holy book. So I need a holy book. I need to read it, study it, and do what it says, and that's really kind of what it needs to be about within my life. But what I want you to realize is that James doesn't start with just the, the doing of the word of God, the obeying of the word of God. He, he starts, I think, something with, that's far more foundational and important uh, is the fact that we are created by the word of God. And then once that takes place, then yes, we want the word of God to be implanted within us and we want to be, then be liberated to live a life that is full and abundant uh, from the truth of the word of God. And so I want us to begin... Uh, this idea in verse 18 of how we are created by the word of God. In fact, that, that word create, even if you go back to Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's one of the few Hebrew words I remember from Hebrew class of uh, bara, that God, uh, in the beginning, God bara, he created, that just with his word, he created that which was nothing into something, that that is who God is. Just with his word, he has the power to create, to do the miraculous, to perform the supernatural. And the same is true for us. It says in verse 18, in the exercise of his will, he, God, brought us forth. 
He brought us forth. It's, it's that imagery that we talked about last week. Remember last week, uh, desire was having a baby and sin was having a baby and, and God was having a baby. Like we saw a lot of babies last week, a lot of things that were being conceived, brought to life. And specifically here, we see that God, he brings us forth. We are new creatures in Christ. We are born again. This, this language, this idea of being brought forth, of being conceived, um, isn't just particular to James. Some of you may remember the story where uh, Jesus met with one of the high religious leaders, a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And they have this wonderful dialogue of where Nicodemus, this incredibly learned man, knows the word of God, has the first five books of the Old Testament memorized, like he knows the word. And he meets with Jesus in the middle of the night because he's just so impressed and moved by him. And he doesn't even really have a question. You, you ever been in that kind of situation? You just want to be near somebody? Like, I don't really know what to say. I don't really know what I'm wanting to ask. I just want to be near you because you seem to have something about you. And he's just in the presence of Jesus. And he doesn't even ask a question, but Jesus knowing, I think his mind and his heart, he begins to just speak to him. And he says in John chapter three, uh, it says, uh, the rabbi says, uh, or excuse me, uh, Nicodemus says, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered and said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And I love the fact that Nicodemus in no way asked anything about the kingdom of God. He didn't do any of that. Jesus is just like, you know what you need to know, learned man that knows the Bible really, really well. You need to be born again. That's what you need. You could have all of the head knowledge of scripture, but without the, the word of God implanting within you, the spirit of God moving within you for you to be born again, it, it's, not, it's not performing what it's designed to do. I mean, how many of you know individuals, they know the word of God, but they are the biggest jerk in the world. It's like, good for you. You quoted all the Bible, but man, I, I don't like being around you because you're just mean and you're nasty. Maybe it's just me, but I've been around some nasty individuals. And they'll use the word of God as a weapon. Jesus, knowing the heart of what is needed for Nicodemus and for us, he says, you must be born again. And then Nicodemus is confused by this. He says in verse four, how can a man be born when he is old? I mean, this is devastating to a man like Nicodemus, who is incredibly self-reliant. Like he, he has studied, he has learned, he has done so much. And the one thing that Jesus is saying that you need to do that you can't do that is outside of your control is being born again. In the same way that you, Nicodemus, you had no ability to contribute to when you were born by your mama. Like you, you, you didn't, you weren't in the womb going, push mom, push. Like, you know, come on. Like I, I was in those Lamas classes, breathe. <laughs> like you got this mom. You are a passive participant in your birth physically of the flesh and the same means that you are a passive you are a passive participant in being born again spiritually it's not what we do it's what he accomplishes to save our soul and to make us new to create in us to allow us to be born again he says that which is born of the flesh is the flesh that which is born of the spirit is spirit and he says, don't be amazed that I say to you, you must be born again. That language we don't hear very often anymore, but throughout all of scripture, Jesus uses this imagery of being born again. Peter, oh my goodness, um, get a pen out, write these things down. Uh, in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, I didn't even have this in my notes, but it's good. So just hang on one second, if I can find Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again. And, and not just Peter, uh, Paul in Ephesians 2. It's by his great mercy that we are brought to life, that we were dead in our trespasses, and we are brought to life by the mercy and the richness of God. 1 John 5.1 is, 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 is another one. Again, go read those. Like You see just this imagery, whether it's Jesus ultimately, uh, Paul in Ephesians, Peter in 1 Peter, John in 1 John chapter 5, that you have to be born again. It's not just that you have the knowledge but it's that it's a supernatural, miraculous work because, again, a dead man, as it says in Ephesians, a dead man doesn't reach up and grasp uh, someone trying to save them. They need, they need life to be breathed into them. 
They need to be created anew. They need new life. And so my, my hope is that every single one of us in this room, that you've come to a moment where the spirit of God, along with the word of God, have coupled together in order for you to hear the truth of who God is and that you've placed your faith in his grace and his mercy so that you would be born again. It's, it's miraculous. It's absolutely supernatural. Um, in, uh, in Acts chapter 10, we, we don't have time to go there, but what you see is a lot of people make this comment of, man, I really would like to see the spirit of God move. I want to see the fire fall. Me too. Absolutely. But if you want to see the spirit of God move um, at your workplace, maybe in your family, at your school, whatever it may be, what you find in Acts chapter 10, whenever the, the gospel really goes out to the Gentiles, is the story of Peter and Cornelius. After Peter is proclaiming the gospel, the spirit moves. And there's an incredible awakening of the Gentiles coming to faith in Christ. And the beautiful thing is that the spirit of God, along with the word of God, which the spirit of God inspired to be written, they come together. And so if we want to see a great movement of God, then we want to be those who are proclaiming the word of God so that the truth of God, as it says in back in our passage in James, that the truth of God would, would create us, that it would bring us forth to, 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 to life. And so um, in this past week, Tiffany and I, my wife, uh, we were just reading at night before we were going to bed, and I was just reading First Thessalonians. Uh, right now, she's just having a hard time getting to read, uh, like just to look at the, the words on a page. So I was just reading scripture together, and uh, I was reading through First Thessalonians, and as soon as I read a few of these verses in chapter 1 and chapter 2, I was like, oh, Sunday. Like, this is tie-in with Sunday. So First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, it says, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. It's both and, like we need both of these things. We, we need the word of God coupled with the spirit of God in order that we would hear the gospel and we'd be convicted. He goes on in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. He says, for this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it as the, not the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God. There's something powerful. There's something wonderful. There's something life-giving about the word. That's why it says in James 1, 18, in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. He accomplishes this. And it might be, well, how, how is this possible? It's by the word of God, it's by the word of truth. And so, before, before we go on to the, uh, I would say the applying, the, the receiving of the word, having it implanted, the law of liberty allows us to live a life that is with wisdom and full and being able to navigate the, the trials and the different areas of life that we all are going to have to deal with. That most fundamental is James is not espousing some just read the word of God and obey it and you'll be good. It's no, 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 no. You need to be first created by the word of God. You need to be a new creature in Christ so that the word of God, when it does take root within you, then it begins to really produce fruit within your life. And so there's power in the word because we are created by the word. But secondly, we're also not just to be created by the word of God, by his grace, but we're implanted with the word. We're implanted with the word of God. He says at the end of um, at verse 22, he says, in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. I believe as he's talking here, the saving of your souls has so much to do with uh, sanctification, which our salvation that we receive in Christ, um, when we come to recognize that we are in need of a savior and he creates in us, he, we're born again, we are made righteous. So we are justified in that moment. And then from the moment that we are justified, maybe you were uh, a young child, or maybe just this past year, you placed your faith in Jesus. And by his grace and his mercy, you have been brought forth by his word and you have been born again. But then later on, you're going to live your life. And at some point we're going to breathe our last in our salvation at that point, at that moment, we were justified. But at the end of our life, when we breathe our life, we are glorified. That's called glorification. Both aspects are a part of our whole salvation. 
But there's this in-between period of when we live and traverse this life here on this earth from when we were justified, made righteous with God, to when we breathe our last and we are glorified to be in the presence of God forever and ever. In between is us traversing this sin-soaked world. And in that moment, in that time period, however long it is, God is setting us apart. He's sanctifying us. We are becoming more and more mature and hopefully complete in, in Christ. And I think what he's talking about here, that the word of God, when it's implanted, when we receive it, that it's able to uh, save our souls, that it's, it's further setting us apart, sanctifying us, not making us more saved, but conforming us more and more into the image of, of Christ. And so as a result of this, there should be a desire that if you have been created by the word of truth, that there should be a a thirst and an earnestness that you would want to be implanted with that same word, that you would want it to take root within your life. And so what's easy for us to do, and if you've been with us the last few weeks, is we've seen that every single one of you are going to encounter various trials within your life. We're not exempt from that. I've shared with you repeatedly the last few weeks is that um, God will often give you more than you can handle. And I know we don't like to hear that because you've maybe heard for far too long that God won't give you more than you can handle. And that's a lie. That's nowhere in scripture. God will often give you more than you can ever handle so that you would lean and rely upon him. What he won't do is give you more than you can handle and then tempt you, as it says, as we saw last week, into handling it in a way that would lead to some kind of destructive end. There's always a means out of that temptation. And so within every trial, there is built within it uh, an opportunity to, to grow, to mature, to lean upon the Lord for your faith to be even more, uh, to, for it to persevere, for you to be more, more mature, mature and complete. But also within that trial is the opportunity for temptation to rear its ugly head and for us to respond and to, 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 to snatch at that temptation to have some kind of relief in that moment. And what happens is, is what James is saying in this section is when the word of God is implanted, we need that within our life because when trials come our way, and especially when temptation comes our way, it's easy to be just reactive to that. That's why he says, be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Because maybe again, it's just me, but whenever something hard comes my way, I can be really, really, really quick for the anger to kind of bubble up within of God, how could you possibly? How could this person say this about me? Why would this happen? Where are you, Lord? Don't you, tr don't, don't, don't you love me? Why would you? And on and on it goes. And what I don't realize is anger is beginning to bubble up within me. And then oftentimes when anger begins to bubble up, my mouth begins to bubble out. And I begin to say some things that I wish I could take back because it's not helpful. It's only hurtful in those moments, especially towards those that I might love and care about. There's wisdom in being slow to these things, because it's easy to react. So the best thing that we could do is be slow to that and to receive the word of God so that it would be implanted within us. In John chapter eight, Jesus says, my word has no place in you. He's talking to, again, to, to, to religious leaders who knew the word of God, that, that there's, there's, there's no place for the word within you, that it's not really taking root within your, within your life. He would say, I would think that this, there's filthiness, verse 21, and wickedness that's within your life that you're not receiving this word. And so how do, we, how do we receive this word so that it does become implanted within us? And I think what you find is in the Old Testament is when God gives his people the, the, the law, he has, them, has the law written on stone tablets. Some of you will recall this. And he begins to have the stone tablets read uh, there at Mount Sinai, and the people of God are so excited about the word of God, the law of God on these stone tablets that they're, they're just like, everything you said we will do, God. And God is like, oh, if you had but the heart to do it. They're like, everything you said, God, we're going to do. And it wasn't too much longer until they disobeyed everything on that list. The inclination of their heart was not possible to obey this because their hearts were wicked. And so what happens is, is they, they break all those laws to the point to where you get to the book of Judges. I know we've gone through Judges in our small group and uh, 
that's an interesting quiet time devotion. Uh, you, you have moments of where uh, Jesus, or the, the law is like basically the, the second half of the Ten Commandments is very much your relationships with other people, which is love other people, essentially. And uh, by the time you get into the book of Judges, they're literally chopping up each other and sending body parts to different people. It's really grim. And you're like, Lord, what do I do with my day after reading this quiet time devotions in Judges 21? And I think it's, oh man, people are really wicked except without the grace of God, like they need Jesus. But what you find is that there's this, maybe these, the, the wording of like, man, I hear this word and I want to obey it, but man, I, I just, I can't. And the beautiful thing is that God is at work within the Old Testament and on into the new of where in Jeremiah chapter 31, one of the great prophets of old, in Jeremiah 31, he institutes the new covenant. And he says, I'm going to put my word upon your heart. In fact, it's even coupled in Ezekiel 36 of, I'm going to take that, that heart of stone that you have, I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. But there's something supernatural at work that when we are created and born again in Christ, that hopefully there is a, a yearning and a longing that now that word of God that, that was just revealing to us our sin and our lostness is now something that we can take and really live out and apply and receive the, the, the fruit of it, the life of it that it brings. Because at the core of who we are, we have been changed from the inside out. And so now when we hear the word of God, we don't want to just obey it in a religious sense, but we want to obey it because it's life and it's life giving for us. And so Perhaps the best example is, is Jesus in the gospel of Mark chapter four, uh, uh, teaser, uh, January, 2025, we're going to launch into the gospel of Mark and we're going to journey through that entire gospel over the course of, uh, the beginning of 2025. I've never preached through a gospel in its entirety. I've done all the passion narratives, but I'm looking forward to us going through the gospel of Mark. And, uh, so I'll give you a little bit more detail at that time when we get to Mark four, but for right now in Mark chapter four. There comes a moment where Jesus is in the midst of his earthly ministry. Things are just, they're going well. He's got crowds. He's got people. He's kind of hit this moment of like, man, I want to know who Jesus is. What is he talking about? Could he heal me? Whatever it may be. And so he's got this huge group of people around him. And he's like, all right, disciples, get them together. And they get them all gathered. And he says, I got a story for you. There was a farmer. He went out, sowed some seed. And when he sowed that seed and he cast it out, uh, some of it fell on uh, the road and uh, the birds ate it. And some of it, it fell on some rocky soil and uh, it didn't take root and it died. And, and others of it, uh, the, it was in some thorny, weedy area and it wouldn't take root and, and it died. But then there was a fourth uh, batch of soil that the seed found and it, it took root and it produced and it produced and it produced. If you have ears, you heard it, hope it makes sense bye and he walks off and everyone's like okay awesome what does that mean and his disciples come to him a little bit later and like jesus good story great story i love the farming illustration i was looking forward to the next sermon where you're going to bring in some farming illustration but what does it mean that doesn't make any sense what are you talking about soil and birds and the sun scorching like it just doesn't make any sense and he says all right guys this is what it is the seed is the word of god and when it's being cast out into the world, they're going to be those, the soil represents the hearts of men and women. And they're going to be those that it's not going to penetrate their heart. It's not going to take root. And oftentimes what we do within that parable of the, of the sower is we go, well, I definitely don't want to be the soil that it didn't penetrate at all. I would ideally like to be the one that there's all kinds of fruit that's produced. But if I have to be somewhere in the middle, maybe I could be one of those in the middle. That's not the point of the parable. The point of the parable is you don't want to be soil one, two, or three, because none of them, it lasts. None of them have to do with salvation. It's that you're, you're hearing the things of God, the word of God, and some people are just hard to the things of God and it bounces off. Some people want to play with the things of God or the word of God, but it doesn't take root. The only one that we want to be is the soil that takes the word of God, receives the word of God. It's deeply rooted and implanted within us and it produces fruit. We want to be fruit bearers within our life. And so James comes along in this passage. He says, hey, you've been born again. That word, man, receive it with humility. Let it take root within your life. 
Don't just play around with the things of God or the word of God, but allow it to take root within your life because there is salvation, sanctification, and humbly receiving the word of God. So be implanted with this word. And as a result of this, James says, I believe you will be liberated by the word. Liberated by the word. Um, One of my favorite Psalms talking about uh, the word of God and just the beauty of it and the life of it is Psalm 20. Just listen, it says, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. And when the word of God is received with humility, and you take it in, man, it is, it is life-giving. It liberates you within this life. And I believe the means by which that takes place is that we, we trust the word of God, we obey the word of God, we hear the word of God, and we apply, we do the word of God. He, he says in verse 22 that you wouldn't just simply be uh, hearers. Sometimes people read that and they go, okay, so I need to really be about the doing. Yes, but you can't do unless you've heard. So he says, don't merely be a hearer. So yes, listen to the word of God when it's being preached, when it's being taught, when you're reading it on your own, but don't just take it in and go, oh, that's good. That's interesting. And then you never do anything with it, but it's that you would take the word of God and you would recognize that this is my life. Like this is something that I need to, to live out and apply within my life, that these are God's words. These are God's statutes that are for my good. If I would, if I would adhere to them, if I would obey them. And so what he does is he says, let me give you an illustration of what this looks like. And he uses that of a, of a mirror. And he, 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 says, he says, I want you in verse 25 to look intently at this perfect law, at this word. Now, a mirror, I would hope, um, is designed to be used so that when you come and stand in front of a mirror, that as you look at it, you're examining yourself within that mirror. And that mirror is showing you who you are. It's revealing things about you. And hopefully the same would be the true with the word of God. The word of God ultimately is the revelation of God. So it reveals to us ultimately who God is, but it also reveals to us who we are so that you can see yourself for who you truly are, especially in the presence of God. And so one person put it this way. There's a difference between uh, looking at the word of God, glancing at it versus gazing at it. In the same way that there's a difference between you glancing at a mirror at yourself and gazing at that mirror. When you glance at the word of God, you kind of hear it, you forget it, and you don't really do anything with it. But when we gaze, hopefully it's giving our our time, our attention, our devotion. So again, Tiffany and me, uh, 20 years ago, 2004 is when we first met and uh, started pursuing that sweet little girl. And uh, I remember whenever we were beginning to, to go out, um, maybe this is just, again, just me, but there'd be times that I would go and pick her up for us to go out. And she'd be like, I just need, I just need like five more minutes, 10 more minutes. All right, I'm sorry, just a little bit of time. And I was like, man, what are you doing? And uh, it, what was funny is I found out later is she said, well, I, I, just, I, wanted, I, wanted, I wanted to make sure everything was in its proper place and in order. And she said, I would just stand in front of that mirror and I'd just be like, ooh, that hair could go a little bit over here. And you know what? Uh, ooh, 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 my, my, there's some lipstick on my teeth. I need to get that off. That doesn't look right. And she would examine herself and see from the mirror. And she had an expectation that when I stand in front of this mirror, it is going to reveal to me what I need to know about myself and maybe what I need to do about it. The difference is, is when I would get in front of the mirror, I would just look at it and go, you look good, let's go. And I would just, I would just go on about my day. I wouldn't take any time to really examine. And then she's like, you got some stuff in your teeth. I didn't want to say anything because we aren't that new into the relationship and I didn't want to embarrass you. And, and I realized there's a real difference in, in, in the way stereotypically, perhaps, that men and women might stand in front of a mirror. Uh, so in this instance, be like the lady who would stand in front of the mirror and have an expectation that there's something here that I'm going to see that I need to see. And not just in the negative sense of like there's correction. Um, 
I, I love it when my wife will stand in front of the mirror and she's looking and getting ready for the day and she's got on a blouse or something. She's like, I think this really goes good with my eyes. And I'm like, yes, it does. What you see is not all bad. It, there's, there's some things that you're seeing. They're like, God, oh, that's good. Let's continue that. There are going to be things that when we read the word of God, that yes, is going to step on your toes and you're going to be convicted. But there's also going to be moments where you're going to read the word of God and you're going to be moved and you're going to be encouraged and you're going to be built up and you're going to be seeing that, oh man, look at the goodness of God and the grace of God. Oh God, thank you for what I do have in my life. And at the same time, oh God, thank you that I can see that if I keep going this direction, then I'm not going to handle this trial well. And in fact, if I respond in this way to this temptation that's wanting me to take this, this trial or this difficulty in that direction, I believe that it's going to lead to some kind of destructive end, not for my good or for your glory, but it's just going to be hard. And the way that I want to know to navigate that is, man, I got to be in your word. Psalm 119, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When the word is a lamp unto your feet, you get to see where you are. And when the word is a light unto your path, you see where you need to go. Do you know where you need to go? Do you know how to navigate the things that you face? Because it's, it's so easy for us to just go through the motions and just go through it all and be like, I'll figure it out. And, you know, hopefully the grace of God will be with me. And yes, hopefully so. But he's given you his word to help you to navigate the, the areas of life that you're going through. I love that. In John 17, verse 17, Jesus, the night before his betrayal, or the night of his betrayal, the night before his crucifixion, he's praying to his Father in heaven, and he says, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. I pray that the word would get into them so they would know the truth. It would set them free, and they would know how to navigate within this life. James says in verse 25 that we would look intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty. I began to think about that idea, the law of liberty. Our laws liberating, our laws freeing. Well, I don't know many people who are looking to vacation in North Korea because it's lawless and it's dangerous. I know sometimes we're like, oh, I, I, I don't want this law within my life. I don't want this word within my life because I feel like it's restricting me. But I would say that some law, it, it sets you free. Some law, some structure, it keeps you from dangerous things. So much so that if we would listen to the word of God within our life, that I believe, as he says here, we'll be blessed if we obey it, if we do it. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, at the very, very end of that sermon in Matthew chapter 7, um, Jesus finishes his sermon after this incredible, uh, incredible message. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, does them, obeys them, may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and slammed against the house, yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them, obey them, trust them, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. This sounds so much like James chapter 1. When you encounter various trials, both the wise man and the foolish man, they both had houses, and they both dealt with storms. One was able to navigate through it, and one was destroyed. It was all about who was listening to the word of God obeying and applying the word of God within our lives. One of the things as I was studying this passage this past week is that I'm so grateful that God is very much about the, the big picture or the way that I'm going to phrase it, the, the macro, his glory, forgiveness, grace, mercy, salvation, all of those things. He is, he's big on that, obviously. But aren't you... Aren't you so grateful that yes, he's about that and we have to start certainly with that, but he's also about the, the, the micro. He, he's also about how you do navigate your day-to-day -day life. His word is sufficient for both the macro and the micro, the, the big picture of you need grace and you need salvation and you need forgiveness and it's about the glory of God. But, but also I, I've, I've heard people say, 
I mean, I need a word from the Lord today. Me, me too. <laughs> it's the fact that, Lord, I, I, I believe that your word says that you love me. And I believe that. But man, I'm having a hard time believing and trusting you in this financial matter right now. It reminds me of, of Mark, uh, Mark chapter 8 or 9 of the, the, the man who tells Jesus, Jesus, I believe, but you help my unbelief. I believe in my salvation. I believe that Christ died for my sins. I believe by his grace and his mercy and me throwing myself at his mercy. Oh, Lord, would you save me? Would I be born again? Oh, Lord, thank you for my salvation. But what do, what do I do with this, with this drama at work? How, how do I navigate the day-to-day? -day? I, I, I have a confidence in the eternal and I need to see that as the big picture, yes. But right now, my best friend got a diagnosis that's changing their life forever physically. How do I navigate that? And I love that the Lord doesn't just leave us into the wind and go, your soul is good for eternity. He's, he sees you today. He's given you his word and his truth to navigate today. I love how practical James is of these various, these multicolored trials that we're all going to experience and face. He's talking when he writes this letter to very real individuals who are struggling financially and relationally and physically. And he gives them, yes, the big picture truth, but he also comes right down to like, almost like we're, you're sitting at a, at, a, at a coffee shop across from someone and just being like, can, can, we just, can we just talk for just a second about, about what's going on? And I mean, how, how, do I, how do I handle this relationship? What do I do with my career? How do I handle my finances? What am I supposed to be doing with everything going on politically right now? I mean, I know we say this all the time. Uh, at least I've heard it all my life of we are in unprecedented times. And it's like, okay, we're always, it seemed to be in unprecedented times. But I would say uh, we've been in some unprecedented times historically, just as a, as a country, we, we have. I mean, there was a presidential debate in June. That's never happened before. And then the assassination attempt and someone dropping out from a nomination, someone taking up a nomination. And it's just been a whirlwind of, whoa. And regardless of which side of the aisle you're on politically, I mean, how do I navigate all this? There's so much noise and so much vitriol and venom and just anger. And it could be so easy. And it makes me go back to when we started this, this year going through the letter of Jude and wanting to launch and knowing that this year could be tumultuous because of the year that we're in. That what Stephen, Pastor Stephen, can't come to you and go, oh, we're going to navigate through this. You're going to be just fine. Like, it's going to be all good. Fear might rear its head. Anger might rear its head. Worry might come your way. And what I don't want to do is come along and say, oh, well, you know, just trust in the Lord. That's true. But what I want to come along and say is, would you look intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, the truth that is never changing, never wavering, regardless of what political climate we find ourselves in, relationship issue you find yourself in, financial struggle you find yourself in. Those struggles are still there. They're not just going to go magically away. But... When I have your word as a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, I can navigate this stuff. And I think when we, I think when we get to that kind of mindset, what we begin to see is that, Lord, I believe that your word, if I would listen to it, hear it, obey it, apply it, then you will show me who I am in this circumstance or this trial and where I need to go, and how I'm supposed to go about it according to your word. One more quote from the great reformer Martin Luther. He says, in a word, 
The Holy Scripture is the highest and best of books, abounding in comfort under all afflictions and trials. It teaches us to see, to feel, to grasp, and to comprehend faith, hope, and charity far otherwise than mere human reason can. And while evil oppresses us, it teaches how these virtues throw light upon the darkness and how after this poor, miserable existence of ours on this earth, there is another and an eternal life. So when wisdom receive with humility the word of God and obey it. And I believe it will set you free from destructive ends. I suppose the last word I would say on this, I mentioned it at the beginning. And we don't have time to unpack all this, but in John 1, it speaks about the word became flesh. I love the fact that the apostle Paul I believe echoes and amens James as James starts off this section of you have been brought forth. You're created by the word of truth. Sometimes I think some trials that you're going to experience and you're trying to navigate and you're getting into the word and you're like, I I just, I, I just wish it would say, Stephen, do this. Or Stephen, say that. Or Stephen, this is how you handle it. Like, why can't it just say that? Because I'm, I'm, I'm stressed out over this. And I think there's going to be a lot of circumstances where we have that. We're reading the word and we're coming into the word. And the thing that I hope that it brings us back to again and again and again is that ultimately what the word of God does from Genesis to Revelation is that it is a tutor and it is a focus point pointing us to the word incarnate Jesus Christ. And again, this isn't just us sprinkling Jesus in at the end of a sermon. But if we're going to traverse this world and we're going to live out, as it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse one, that if we're going to go through this world, man, we got to fix our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith. And his name is Jesus. If you you want to navigate this world well and wisely, yes, get into the word. But man, also don't forget to fix your eyes on the word incarnate Jesus. Otherwise you miss the point and you're just like, oh, I'm just going to adhere to a bunch of rules and and guidelines and standards. Sure. But if you miss Jesus, you miss the point in the same way. There are those who they can read the old Testament, have a great understanding of the old Testament, but then they don't realize as Paul says that all of this is a foreshadowing. It's a tutor pointing to the one that is going to come and set you free so that you truly have life abundant now and in eternity. And so the beauty of it is is that God, our father doesn't just give you Jesus, though he does praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He also does give you his word. So couple these invest in these set your eyes and your affection upon Jesus and both and, and humbly receive the word of God, that it would be implanted within your heart, get into the word so that the word will get into you. As opposed to sometimes what we do is, again, if you were in the middle of a desert, thirsty, and someone said, here's some water, you wouldn't go, oh, this is interesting water. When was this written? Who translated this? Oh, man. We should have a conference about this and discuss this water. No, you drink it. It's your life. And so I don't know what that looks like for you as far as rhythm, routine, and discipline of getting into the word. Some people are like, oh, you got to get, 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 in, get into the word in the morning. If you do, great. I mean, I got to get into the word. You know, I, it's really hard for me to be able to sit down and read because I got to get up so early. I got to get to work. I got to get to class. Got to do this. And so the best thing I can do right now is maybe listen to the word being read to me through the Bible app. Awesome. But how are you choosing to be disciplined in such a manner that I want to steal away moments in time that I can be in his presence with his word in front of me so that I could read it, hear it, listen to it, and apply it within my life. If you would just bow your head, close your eyes for just a second. The reason why I'm asking you to do that is because I want to ask you a couple of questions and maybe it helps you stay a little focused and undistracted. And this, trust me, the the, the intent of today is hopefully for you to fall uh, a little bit more in love and a little bit more, uh, you're a little bit more precious with the word of God and have a, a zeal to just, man, I want to read. I want to get into it. But I do want to ask you just an honest question before you and the Lord. What, what amount of time did you spend in the word this past week? 
And again, it's not, it's not a guilt thing. It's just, it's just a question, gen- genuinely just a question. How much time did you steal away with, with, the, with, with the word of God and, and Jesus? And I'm not saying that the magic pill or potion is, oh, if I read this amount every day and I pray this much for this long every day, I will be calm and be at peace and things will be so much easier. But sometimes when we're navigating this world, if we're not careful, we're gonna navigate it in such a way that it's only by your wits and your wisdom and just your gumption to see it through. And we have to realize the precious gift that is his word of truth. And so my hope is that today that there would be an inclination, a compulsion to want to humbly receive his word, that it would be rooted deep within your soul. And so maybe in just a moment as we sing, we sing about this idea of turning your eyes, turning your affection, if you will, upon Jesus. I wonder if you could begin to kind of examine what would be some practical things within my life that I could apply to ensure that I'm I'm stealing away with Jesus and his word. Father, we thank you so much for your truth. We thank you so much for your word that you would reveal yourself to us through your word that we could know you that we could see our need for you, that we could see our sin, and that you are the one making it possible for us to have hope and salvation uh, for eternity, but also hope and life for today. And so, Lord, as we kind of examine ourselves for a moment and think about what we've heard today, by your grace and by your mercy, may we apply it in Jesus' name. Amen.